Hello, everyone. Welcome to my talk. Uh, my name is Olivier Melois, and I'm going to be introducing the Mill Build tool. So I am a software engineer working for Disney Streaming. I've got a, about eight years of Scala under my belt, and you can find me on GitHub. Um, so Mill, in short, Mill is a project that was uh, first released in early 2018 after how really had written a blog post around some of the problems that SBT has that prevent its users from building a mental model of um, how it works. So Mill is built on top of Harmonite. It is a competitor to SBT, obviously. It's got about 1.6K stars on GitHub. And those are the useful links. It's a very healthy project. It is very much not a pet project anymore. I think it's fair to say. It is maintained by Howie Lee and Tobias Roser. Mostly these days, it's Tobias who does the uh, work of maintenance. So in order for me to define Mill, I have to define what, what a build tool is. And a build tool is a piece of software that help aims at facilitate converting source files into binaries or executables. Usually it comes with a number of capabilities that help manage dependencies or test your software, uh, package it into applications or publish uh, library artifacts, for instance. Um, Mail differs from SBT is that in that uh, it is a general purpose build tool that happens to have Scala building capabilities. So it doesn't really assume that you're gonna build Scala code. It just provides you with the capabilities to do so. It is CLI based, so you manip manipulate your build uh, using command lines from the terminal, as opposed to opening a repo. Um, it builds off the object-oriented semantics of the Scala language, as opposed to providing a DSL to define your build. Uh, it has caching by default and I think it's important to to um, point that out. The ecosystem of Mail is much smaller than SBT. The plan of this talk is to talk about the various building blocks that Mail offers out of the box, the tags, the modules, and then we'll segue into how those things are used to build uh, Scala, Scala code. Right, so let's start with the tasks. Um, so this is a valid build file in Mail. It's the, the sort of file that Mail is going to look for is the build.sc file. And it defines a top level uh, task or target um, using this, this T construct here that captures some Scala expression and some metadata associated to the definition here, like the, the name of the, the method. And it's going to expose or Mail will expose this task as a as a common line um, command that you can call call from your terminal. So in order to call this task, I just need to call Mail hello. I use the show command in order to notify Mail that it should output the or print the output of the task in the standard output of my terminal. So it's very, very intuitive. If I had just run Mail hello, I would have had uh, executed the side effects associated to the to my definition, but I I want to have the output in there. Uh, so for the rest of the talk, we're going to disable the ticker, the ticker the ticker being the sort of small logs that you see there that are essentially a progress bar. When you run a task, you'll see some logs that say oh, I'm currently running this or I'm currently running that. And obviously, to make the the slides a little bit lighter, we're going to disable this. Um, so the thing, one of the first thing that you need to notice with Mail is that targets, those little tasks here that are wrapped in the DST construct are cached. So if you perform some side effect in it, Mail will all only execute um, those side effects the first time the task is run. Otherwise, it will store the value or it will refer itself to the previously computed value that it stores somewhere. So in this example, we're logging some information using this sort of t.ctx API that Mail provides you that ties the log statement to the task that is being defined. Um, so when I say I've done this, if I run the hello2 task a first time from our terminal, I'll see both the logged statement and the output of the, the task. If I, if I run it a subsequent time, 
I will just see the output. So Mill has cached the output of the task and uses that for the subsequent runs. So it's important to, to understand where the cache live and how, how it kind of works. So in a similar fashion uh, to SBT storing uh, data inside the target folders, Mill has an out folder that is going to store data and outputs in. The out folder, you, so you get a global out folder for the whole workspace, and the out folder will match in terms of structure, the structure of your build. So we defined a hello task and a hello to task. We find a hello folder and a hello to folder within our out folder. If we dive into the hello folder, we see two files, the log file, which contains the log statements, obviously, and this meta.json file, which contains the value that our task outputted when it was run, as well as a couple hashes, uh, hash values. Those values are how Mill is able to detect whether it needs to rerun to re-execute some task in the subsequent run. We'll see about that a little bit later. So just a word of warning, if you change anything in the build, Mill will consider that uh, the cache has to be invalidated and will start executing things again. Um, so obviously when you start um, building your or composing your build, you want to be able to call some other tasks from your tasks. So the way it's done is by applying those empty parentheses to your task within the body of a, a T instruction. It's a bit similar to the async await pattern uh, popularized in JavaScript, for instance. So the T would be your async block, for instance, and the uh, parentheses would be similar to the await block. You cannot call a task from outside of a T, um, for instance. Um, so that's how you sort of compose tasks together using this, this pattern. Once you have a task that's composed of other tasks, you can inspect it using this, this inspect command, um, which will give you insight as to what the task is and what it depends on. So in our example, for instance, we have um, two, our hello world task depends on two tasks, the hello task and the word task. And so Mill has statically captured this information and is able to tell you that your task depends on those two upstreams. It also captured the, the Scala doc above the method, and it will use that to give you the insight here um, that you see when you run the command from the from your terminal. All right. Um, so because Mill uses empty sets of parameters to indicate that you, you want to run a task within another task, it prevents you at compile time from declaring task using parameters. So you get this sort of helpful, if you try to define a target using a set of parameters, you'll get a compiler saying, oh, you can't do that. Um, all right, so if targets are cached, we obviously want some stuff to be always re-evaluated. And Mail provides you with this input construct that indicates that things should always be re-evaluated. Uh, inputs are basically uh, the top of your build graph. They cannot depend on other tasks. They are the things that Mail is going to look at first to decide whether it should recompute some things. So in this example, we're um, we're returning the local date in the form of a string. Then we can define commands, which are um, essentially tasks that can take parameter method parameters. Uh, so in this example, what we get is a command that will print some little greeting, taking the name of a person as a parameter and referring um, to two tasks that we've previously defined, the hello task here and the two-day task here. And so we are composing their respective values together, concatenating, concatenating them and putting them to the standard output. In order to call our command, we just need to call meal and the name of the command. If we forget the arguments, 
mail will display a very helpful message saying, oh, well, you've forgotten the name uh, parameter. And so you can amount your call and pass the parameter either by specifying it by name as such, or just trusting the order of the parameters. A little bit like Scala does for when you want to instantiate case classes or call methods, you can just pass the parameters in the right order or refer, that, refer, refer to them by name. So until now, we've defined tasks that output strings. Um, Mail lets you define custom output types. So in this example here, we're defining a, a person case class and we're defining a task that returns an instance of that case class. At compile time, will we'll, the compiler, when compiling the, the build file, will complain that the person case class is not associated with uh, an implicit value for um, read writer. So what it means is that in order for outputting um, data, the data needs to be associated with a JSON codec. And that's because our cache files are written in JSON and our output um, that we print to the standard output when we call mail from the terminal is using JSON as a format. So in order to address this problem, we're just using the, the um, functions provided by the Upical library, who's from the same author as Mill, Hao Yili. And we have this very boilerplate-free um, function that lets us derive a JSON codec for our case class. And once we've done this, the mail, the mail build will happily compile and will be able to call upon this uh, person task displaying the JSON format of our data. Um, that's actually really useful that mail uses JSON as a, as a sort of standard format for its output, because you can pipe this result onto other tools. So mail is very terminal friendly uh, or command line friendly that way. You can um, use the JSON format to interrupt its results with other tools like JQ or some other things. Okay, so obviously, as part of any build, we're gonna have to interact with files, with the file system. We're gonna have to read source files. We're gonna have to write files somewhere. Um, so in order to read files from the build or from the workspace rather, um, Mail provides a source construct for, for tasks. So it's equivalent to to an input, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of task that's always going to be reevaluated. Um, it takes a path as, as um, its body and it outputs a path ref. And a path ref is essentially the combination of a path in your file system and a hash that um, essentially gives a summary of the contents under that path. So whether the path, uh, points to directory or, or a simple file, mail will automatically compute a hash of the contents and will store them or store the hash uh, next to the path in the path ref so that it can decide whether some tasks have to be recomputed or not. So here we are pointing to the foo.txt file. We're defining the subsequent task that is gonna read from this, this file using the oslib library once again uh, developed by the same uh, person, how really. It's a very nice library for manipulating um, files or the file system. Um, so what we're doing is we're essentially getting the path from our path ref. We use os.read to read the, the contents of that file. We log a little statement and we return the content as the output of our task. So in order to um, to get some intuition for what happens. We're writing some content into our foo.txt file at the root of our workspace. Then we're calling that foo command that essentially observes the foo.txt file. And we see this output there. So we see the path of our file and we also see this little hash value there. Then if we call the full contents that get the contents of that file, we'll see the log statement here and the output. 
So this, this is log statement. This is a side effect that's performed by Mill when it executes the, the task. If we run the task once again, nothing has changed. We haven't made any change to the file. So we are not seeing the log statement anymore. We just see the contents of our file. Mill will sort of know that it has to recompute anything that depends on the on that file. So if we run the task that observes the file again, we'll get a different hash this time. And that will indicate to Mill that it will have to recompute the full contents rather than referring itself to the cache. And this time around, we'll see this log statements once, once again, and we'll get the new value as the output of the task. All right, so that's for reading files. Uh, when we want to write files um, in our build, what we use is this contextual API thing that essentially gives us access to the folder under the out folder that is dedicated for our task. And we get a little destination folder. So what we're doing here is we're uh, defining a path, we're writing some content into this path and we are outputting a path ref. And it's important to always output path refs when you um, write files so that it, so that Mill can know whether to recompute downstream tasks. All right, so here we're executing the task that we've just defined. Um, we are just looking at the output of the task. So we're looking at the, the directory and a path where the file was returned and you can see that it's under out slash bar which is the name of our task slash destination and the name of the file as we set it if we list the contents of this test folder uh, we'll see the file that we've written and if we print the contents we'll see the contents that we've written so mail gives you the sort of reserved space uh, for task to write contents into all right so now we're going to talk about modules. So modules are similar to SBT's concept of project and also similar to SBT's concept of scope. It's a, it's a way to group tasks together. And the way it works is basically by just extending some trait. So you define an object and then underneath this object in your build file, in your build file, sorry, you can define some, some tasks. So we're defining a hello task there and a location task. And the location task refers itself to this, this method that's provided by the module, which gives the, it's the path that Mill expects source files to be found for that particular module. It's sort of a reserved input folder for this module. And very intuitively, the way that we are calling upon this task from the terminal or the task defined under the module is basically by calling mod dot the name of the task. Um, so here we're calling the hello task from the mod module. And here we're calling the location task. And you can see that mil allocates or assigns the mod folder to the mod module. So it's very intuitive. Like if you have source files that are, un that are associated to the mod module, they should leave under the mod folder. So what about plugins? So because we have this very object-oriented way of defining things, a plugin in Mail is basically just going to be an abstract module. So it's, it can be a trait, for instance, or an abstract class. And you can define a number of uh, tasks inside it. And then in order for uh, your users to use your, your plugin, they just have to extend to mix in the plugin into their own modules. And that gives them access to whatever task you've defined yourself. Um, so if you want to force the user to define some settings, for instance, all you need to do is basically define an abstract task, an abstract T inside your, your abstract class. Uh, so here we're defining a an abstract setting that, that is expected to be a list of string. And we're defining a command that uses the setting and uh, logs the values into the 
into the or using the log uh, contextual API. So when we call the DES, and then we extend uh, a module using DES plugin. So when when we call the command from the terminal, we'll get a compile time error saying that we've forgotten to implement the, the setting. So it's a very important difference from SBT in that you'll get this information when your build is compiled as opposed to when you try to run the task. Obviously, um, mail being, um, mail being in, uh, sorry, interacted from the terminal, interacted with from the terminal, we when we call the task, the build is going to be recompiled and then we'll get the error. But the, the fact that the error comes at compile time is really, really good uh, user experience, in my opinion. All right, so all we need to do to fix it is basically provide the value in the same way that you would fix a compile error in a standard Scala project. And once you've done that, you can start playing with the task again or the command. So what if you, what if there is a setting or a task that's provided by a plugin and you want to override it? Well, you just literally override the task or the setting using the override, override keyword from Scala. And you can use the super keyword to refer to the, the previous, um, or this previous setting value that was previously set. So it's very intuitive. It builds on top of your already existing knowledge of the object oriented side of Scala in order to, um, to let you define things. Um, so here you can see the, the test of, of what we've just done. Okay. So when you want to share plugins with people, um, all you need to do is basically publish them to, to an artifact repository. Uh, the, plugins are going to be standard artifacts or standard jars. They don't need to be published um, specifically as a, a mail plugin thing. You can define mail plugins inside a standard Scala project, for instance, publish them to Maven or some other artifact repository. And then the users can use Ammonite's magic imports in order to pull their or pull your plugin into their builds. Um, and those magic imports just have to be at the top of your of your build file, for instance. You don't have to, to set them or to define them elsewhere. Okay, so uh, Mail lets you have as many levels of nesting as you want. So you can define modules under modules under modules. Uh, in this in this example here, we have this following structure: uh, C inside of B inside of A, and C happens to uh, extend our location module there that provides the location task. And in order to call that task from the terminal, we are doing something that's really intuitive. We're just calling A dot B dot C dot location as you would do in your Scala code, for instance. And that gives us what's expected in terms of location, namely the location that mail associates with the C module here is under the location of B, which is under the location of A. So it's like very pragmatic, very intuitive. So once you you start getting a little bit of a complex bit, you, you can use some of the um, commands that mail provides in order to discover what's out there. Like if you have a very complex build, you might, or if you're a newcomer into a project, you might want to, to see what's there. And you have access to this resolve method that will find tasks and modules uh, using a, like a incomplete paths. So you, you start a path and you use this underscore character as a wildcard and mail give you mail gives you everything that's accessible uh, under the a dot path for instance if you want to do it recursively you can do double underscore and you'll get everything that's under a recursively at any level of nesting and it works in 
infix or it works in both prefix, suffix, but also infix position. So if you want to find out, like give me everything that has the location task, for instance, you can do mail resolve underscore underscore dot location and you'll get um, that task path that you can then use in a subsequent command. Um, right, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about cross modules, but say you have a module and you want to, to run it across several settings, um, for instance, for cross compiling a Scala project uh, against several versions of Scala or against several versions of library that doesn't, uh, that isn't binary compatible, um, for instance. What you can do is use a cross module. So the way it works is that you define your your module as a class instead of an object, and then you define some parameters for this class. And you implement your settings using those parameters. And then you define an object that, ex that extends mil.cross, passing your class as a type parameter to that object. And then the various combinations of settings that you want the values that you want all the, the modules to have. Um, so in this case, we have this matrix module that has two parameters. And so we pass tuples of strings there. Um, so what we get then when we resolve what's under the matrix object is we get those combinations of parameters that we've passed. So it's really useful, for instance, if we if you have a complex mat a complex matrix, or if you want to pull um, some settings from a configuration file, for instance, if there's a little dynamic nature to that, that uh, cross modules work very well with. And so you get the various combinations wrapped under those square brackets. And then you can call your task as you would, as if, as if those things had been statically defined within your build. Um, using like mail metrics x y dot do something will give you this task for the specific x y combination. If you try to pass a combination that doesn't exist that you haven't defined, uh, mail will complain about it. Will be it will tell you that it can't resolve that particular combination. All right, drink a little bit of water. Sorry about that. Okay, so what we've seen so far is that mail provides you with a very, or what I think is a very intuitive way of defining tasks and and modules. Um, it uses standard Scala semantics. It uses classes, it uses objects, it uses methods. It doesn't use DSL. So it's easy to understand and to create a mental mo mo model for what a build is, because you can delegate your, your existing knowledge of the Scala language, essentially. So it builds on top of your existing knowledge in order to provide you with the ability to define a build. Uh, so now we're gonna we're gonna use those things um, to describe. The capabilities that Mail provides out of the box for building specifically Scala code. All right. So, out of the box, you can import the content of the Scala package, and you get a bunch of things. And you get, in particular, a Scala module that you can mix in your modules, and that make them what is essentially a Scala project. Um, you'll have to define what version of Scala you want to work against. And once you've done that, uh, oh, sorry, I'm gonna segue a, a little bit into ID support. Um, so if you want, if you're an IntelliJ user, for instance, the probable, the probable best way of editing a mail project using IntelliJ is to use this BSP command, which will dump a configuration file in your workspace that, that IntelliJ will be able to understand to load your project using the build server protocol. Um, as for VS Code and Metals, at the moment, essentially, if you open a mail project into VS Code, you'll get a little pop-up saying, uh, 
do you want to import this mail project? And it uses Bloop under the hood for now. Um, but once you have editor support, in particular in IntelliJ, not only you are going to be able to edit your Scala projects, but you're also going to be able to navigate your build. And what's really interesting is that you can jump to the definition of the various tasks that are provided by the Scala module and see how things are wired together. And you don't get a discrepancy between where the tasks are declared, like settings and task keys in SBT, and where they are implemented. Those things are at the same location. So when you jump to a definition of something, you actually see how it works, which really helps conceptualizing what the build tool is and what, like how the compiler works. Um, I think it are it personally it very much fit my my uh, process. My thought process, I use jump to definition a lot, and it has really helped me conceptualizing how, how things work. Um, all right, so going back to our little A Scala project, we're going to be running some code. So we saw that Mill sort of assigns a folder to each module, and we have our A project. And obviously, Mill is going to be looking for source files under the A folder. So we put our uh, Scala file under a.src. So that is defined within the Scala module um, trait that the sources for a Scala project are under the SRC, uh, SRC folder. So we put a little Scala free program here. And once we've done that, we can run mil a.run very intuitively, passing some parameters, and we'll see the result of our program. But also we see this little logging statement here that say compiling one Scala source to a, a destination folder. And we can see that it uses this, this test folder here. So, and this test is under a slash compile. So essentially Mill has used the reserved destination folder of the a.compile task in order to put the bytecode that is the output of the compilation process. So what's a, a Scala module? Like what does it get you in, in addition to uh, running and, and compiling things? Well, you get all those tasks, you get a very large number of things that Mill uses to wire things together in a way that leads to the outputting of uh, bytecode into the correct folder and the ability for uh, the run task to, to to sort of consume this by code and run a program. So you get there a run task, you get obviously a compile task, you also get um, an assembly task if you want to fat jar for instance, but you get a, a repl task that will start up a Namonite repl with the class path of your project. It's it's quite useful. But more so or more useful than this list of things, you can use this visualize plan command here uh, that's built in Mail, and that takes a task or the path to a task, and we output a graphic representation of your build graph. So it will output those um, those files here, and it, it's going to look like this. So that's a graphic representation of the various tasks that are involved when you run a Scala project. You can see that in order to run the project, I need to have the class path. If I want the class path, I need to compile things. If I compile things, I need uh, some Java C options, some Scala C options, etc. If I was to change my, my source file, my little program here, what would happen is that this source task would be invalidated because the source would change. And therefore, mid, mail would know that it needs to recompute all those things in orange here before it's able to run the program. But the rest, it can trust that the values that are that is got cached in its little caching folder are still valid and it, it doesn't have to recompile or to recompute everything rather. All right, so in order to test, um, Mail provides under the Scala module, you have a test um, 
module definition or test try definition that is tied structurally to the Scala module. So inside your A object, you define another module that you're going to call test, for instance, and that's going to extend s.test. And then you pass, you define dependencies that are required for your test framework to run. And also uh, the, the sort of qualify name of the test framework program. So little uh, shameless plug here. We at Disney Streaming maintain a test framework. It's called Weaver. Go check it out. If you use Cat's Effect, it might be interesting to you. Um, but yeah, it's so a test scope is not a it's not a real scope. It's just a module that happens to live under your Scala module. So once you've done that, you can put a little test class here, and very intuitively, because this test module equals tests, we put it under a slash test slash src. And once we've done that, we can run the test command as such. So me a dot test dot test or shorter meal a dot test because meal allows to define a, a sort of default command associated to each module all right uh module dependencies so if you have a multi-module build you can define uh dependencies between your module you just have to override them override the module depth method here as such what it means is that when so here i've got a b project or b module depending on the a module um so in order to to compile b well we can inspect the the b.compile task in order to understand what it does and we can see that it has got this upstream compile output thing there if we inspect that we'll see that it relies on the output of the a compilation so it's like very logically tied together Okay, uh, cross compiling. I'm gonna skip the uh, the cross the cross compiling against the several Scala versions. Um, it's using the the mail dot cross that I previously described, but I want to talk about uh, more interestingly compiling Scala code against several platforms, so against JVM and JavaScript. So. Ideally, what we would like to have, if we have a piece of, of code that we want to cross compile to both uh, JVM and JavaScript, we would have to have this, this directory structure here. So we'd have a module called C, and under this module, there would be a several source directories, one called SRC, one SRC JVM for what's JVM specific, and what's one uh, for JavaScript. And we want to be able to like specify which one we're going to compile as such c.jvn.compile or c.js.compile so what we're going to do is basically define a module that is going to be constrained to be a scala module so it's a to mix in kind of module that will only be able to extend scala modules and what we're going to do is we're going to override the path that me allocates to to whatever is sent the platform specific, because we want c.jvm to look for the source files under c directly, not under c.jvm. And same for JavaScript. So we're overriding this to say, well, don't look in the usual directory that you will look for uh, that you will look uh, for source files in, but look for the source files in its parent. So os.up means like the parent folder. Then we're overriding the sources task from the Scala module to say, well, the source directories that we're going to look for Scala code in are going to be uh, this thing slash src and this thing slash src dash segment. The segment will be the platform specific string here, JVM or JS. So conceptually, it's quite simple what's going on here. And we're going to use this platform specific mixing here in our um, C cross compiled module. So C itself is not a Scala module. It contains Scala modules. It contains a JVM Scala module and a JS Scala JS module, which was imported from the Scala JS lib here. And for each of those, we're going to define the Scala version uh, for the 
JavaScript one, we also have to define the Scala JS version. And we also define the, the sort of directory segment that we want to look for platform specific uh, source in. Uh, then we put our little program that, that can compile to both JavaScript and JVM. It's a little Hello World program again. Um, and we run mil.c.jvm.run, and that will find the source file in something that JVM knows it should look for source files from. It will find it, it will compile it, and it will run it. And same thing for JS, except that this time it will run the process in Node.js. Right, so this was sort of an example to show how intuitively things are defined. It's really using the object-oriented capability of the language in order to give you the ability to define your builds in a very intuitive, intuitive fashion. Um, I'm going to conclude. I've got three minutes left. Um, so the downsides of Mill is mostly that it's got a drastically smaller ecosystem as SBT. I think that's partially because the build tool is the Mill build tool is simpler, and therefore it's easier to define your own logic. It's easier to define your own uh, plugin. It's easier to define your own code generators, for instance, than it is to do in SBT. And therefore, people are less incentivized to share plugins because it's easier to to write behavior and plug it into your um your build logic um but obviously like sometimes there are some golden paths that are provided by the sbt ecosystem if you want to build a docker image for instance you've got the sbt native package which is really good so if you're used to sort of one way of doing things thing and that's the sbt way of doing things um it's usually better to stick with sbt it's it's easier you'll get less less friction however if you have to write a complex build or if you want more control over what you build allows for if you want something that you're going to understand mill is definitely something that you should consider in addition you get all the goodies from the ammonite and uh all the libraries or Ammonite tool and all the libraries that Howie Lee has, has written, which are, there's lots of libraries and they are re all really, really decent. Uh, the build is really easier to navigate. So even newcomers that are new to the Scala language will have an easier time understanding a mail build than an SBT build, generally speaking. Um, it lowers the reliance on, on the ecosystem because the build semantics are simpler and therefore you can it's easier to define your own plugins, essentially. And I personally find that it doesn't get in the way uh, of my workflow, especially when I define like really complex builds. It, it helps me rather than, than uh, creating friction. Um, in terms of what's to come um, in the mail project, so mail is currently, or the latest release is version 0.9.9. .9. Version 0.10 will see the first uh, binary compatibility guarantees, which will help the ecosystem. It will help people publish plugin, I think, and it will help the ecosystem grow. Uh, but also the strengthening, of, strengthening of the BSP implementation, which will allow for people using metals, I think, to uh, to use the BSP instead of Bloop, and therefore bridge the gap between the editor and the build tool. Um, all right, uh, that's my talk. I know it was really dense. Thank you for uh, sticking with me. Thank you for listening. I'll take some questions now. All right, thank you so much for your talk. And I think we have at least one question. We might have some more, but uh, you really wrapped it up there nicely at the end. And I think that addressed some people's questions. So uh, let's get to this one question here. How does Mill compare to something like Bazel for mono repos? All right. So I think it fits um, a niche where you might want a mono repo, but not a huge one. Like if you want for a small team to have a single repository where multiple services, multiple libraries are going to be defined. Mail is probably a good choice. It will be less complex conceptually than Bazel. 
if you have a huge um, huge repository that all your organization uses and that's like hundred of people, then Bazel is probably uh, better suited because it's it's gonna handle things like remote caching. Um, so do a lot of things that Mail does, but at a bigger scale essentially. But Mail was inspired partly from what Bazel does, if that makes sense. Awesome. All right, I think that's all the questions we have. So thank you again for your talk today and thank you for joining us at ScalaCon. Right. Thank you very much for having me. Have a good day or evening. You too. You too.